ahorita. Mauro. Welcome, welcome everyone to section five section of uh, EDP and the Applied Mathematics Seminar. Uh, today we have two research, uh, Juan Luis Vasquez and Eduard Fateris. Uh, to introduce Juan Luis Vasquez, we call the uh, Spanish Brasileiro, <laughs> Professor Henrique Calas, <laughs> and <laughs> to introduce Eduardo Pérez, we call the young and brilliant, brilliant uh, Professor Brasileiro Spanish <laughs> Diego. So, Henrique, uh, introduce now the Professor Juan, please. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mauro. Uh, it is uh, really a great pleasure for me uh, to introduce uh, Juan Luis. He is uh, an old friend of me, so I am really very happy to have him here, and I thank him uh, very much for participating in this seminar. It is uh, impossible, in fact, to present him uh, in a uh, with justice because it, his CV is so long and so large that uh, and so important that I can only say that he has been uh, during a long time uh, one of the most famous and renowned mathematicians in Spain. Uh, he has been a national prize in Spain of mathematics. He has also uh, many merits regarding uh, uh, the Spanish uh, 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 Society of uh, Applied Mathematics. So, uh, well, uh, uh, as I have said, uh, there are so many uh, things to say that I prefer to uh, let him speak and uh, uh, speak for himself because uh, I'm sure that he will give a very good, uh, very good, very beautiful uh, uh, conference. So uh, thank you very much, Juan Luis, for being here. And uh, I, I'm sure that, the, as always, your talk will be uh, fantastic. The title of the talk today is Nonlinear Diffusion Equations, Driving by Fractional Operators, Semigroups, Self-Similarity, and Asymptotic. So uh, you can start as you want. Uh, and thank you again. OK. Uh, thank you very much for this invitation. I have been taking a look at the web page and I see lots of friends uh, in the past um, as an uh, announcement for the future. So this is good company. I thank uh, uh, Fernand Cara for having invited me and convinced me there to participate. Uh, eu estou sempre muito contento de falar com os amigos brasileiros portugueses. Tenho muitas lembranças que são muito boas. Estou contento. Tenho razões para estar contento hoje, mas depois podem ver as razões. Ok, so the talk I will give today is a combination of uh, past ideas and uh, relatively recent ideas. And uh, so it has essentially two parts. One of them is talking which is uh, the physical name for the kind of equations I have been trying to understand for many years. In fact, uh, starting around 1980. And uh, this covers uh, the first part of the talk uh, and the second, which is the introducing the linear and nonlinear equations that I will be uh, discussing and uh, making the emphasis on the difference on um, nonlinear and linear. Why nonlinear equations pose number of problems that uh, lead directly to a different world. The nonlinear world has many theorems, many lemmas, many ideas, and it is based on different uh, methods from the linear uh, equations. And both are beautiful, but they are different. And after that, I will pass to the fractional diffusion, which is something I did after more or less uh, 2007. So it's essentially now 15 years from that. 
And uh, the last part, uh, Gallardo uh, norms and infinity Laplacian is things I did after I was a uh, pension. I, I was uh, un jubilado. And this is, I mean, it's fun for me because I I'm still have uh, the drive to do mathematics. Mathematics is beautiful. And uh, let me try to start. Uh, so diffusion uh, is a way of presentation what I do, which is one of the possible ways. As you know, mathematics is uh, an art in itself, but it has many connections with the outside world. And some of these connections are, many of the typical connections are based on the uh, understanding of the physical world. So this is one way of presenting the mathematics you do, is going to the physical world to look for motivation. And I was for a long time uh, very involved in Spain with applied mathematics. I was even a president of the Society for Applied Mathematics in Spain, which was much fun. These are very nice people. And uh, then sometimes I go back to pure mathematics, but it is going and coming is a part of the fun. And diffusion is very easy to describe for people in physics because what you want to say is that there is a continuous medium, for instance, a population, and this continuous medium spreads and tries to occupy available space. So you look for models, and then you have all kinds of applications like fluids, like chemicals, bacteria, animals, uh, different populations, the momentum of viscous Newtonian fluid diffuses. This is very important. Navier-Stokes equations have a very critical term, which is the diffusion. And then there is a uh, diffusion in the stock market, which was a really big novelty at the end of the 20th century. And now everybody knows that there is this uh, diffusion models in the stock market. Basically in the stock market, they do um, stochastic approximation to them, but we will see that this is equivalent. And I give you a picture, very simple picture of what is diffusion for the people in physics. You get a, a, a solvent and then there are some, uh, in solute, solute in inside and the solute is kind of particles and they are very concentrated on the left and they try to move to the right because of this uh, gradient of concentration as a driving force, which is basically called Fourier law. And the question for mathematics is, so now that you know what is uh, diffusion for physics, can you model it in mathematics? Can you do the computations? Uh, will you do the quantitative aspect? And this is where physics and mathematics join. And uh, in fact, there are two answers and the answers were very intelligent. And uh, it took a long time for mathematicians to understand that this was uh, possible to model. Uh, the first answer is uh, the idea of particles uh, going around by probabilities. And this is a correct answer. And then in the beginning, you get a random walk as discrete particles bumping into each other. And then you get in the limit, the Brownian motion, which is an invention of the 20th century. Brownian motion was introduced in 1920s by Wiener Levy, uh, trying to understand uh, what was the object that if you pass to the limit of the discretization in space and discretization in time, is there something that you can tell that it's there explaining how to move? And they found Brownian motion. And from Brownian motion, you get to stochastic processes, and then you write the E to equation that essentially says that the increment of space is due to Increment of time times B, which is the velocity, sorry for the B, has to be a V, but we write it B. And then there is another summand, un autre summando. This summando is one half of sigma times DW. DW is the white noise and is responsible for the stochastic part. And this is related to the Brownian motion. And then sigma is a coefficient, there's a diffusion coefficient. 
So it looks very nice. You have a first uh, part on the right hand side is the deterministic component, and the second part is the stochastic component. And then there is a theory that can be developed, and they did it, but uh, we don't like that because we are people in PD, so we want to do something else. In fact, this something else uh, was discovered by Andrei Kolmogorov, the great uh, Russian scientist, in 1930s by analyzing what was the elementary movement of this Brownian motion if you go back to the discretization. And you discover the discretization of this Brownian motion is equivalent to the heat equation. So formula number one and formula number two are two ways of looking at the same phenomenon. But what you look is at different uh, measurable quantities. In one of them, you look at uh, elementary movements. In another one, you look at U, and U is a uh, pointwise concentration. So it's completely different way of looking. But people in mechanics are used to look at different ways. One of the ways in standard fluid mechanics is looking at your Eulerian coordinates. Another one is look at Lagrangian. And everybody knows that they give completely different approaches, but the same, the, the fluid is the same. And this is what happens here. So there are two ways of doing it. And we will prefer the second way. And the second way is writing the heat equation and solving it. Now, solving the heat equation is much easier than solving the uh, Ito equation. And this is the uh, advantage in this case of analysis over stochastic processes. I mean, not all of it is advantages because stochastic processes are very powerful in their own way. So there, were, there will be, uh, pros and cons, but essentially the main point for the student is that the heat equation is easier. So if you want to solve the heat equation, uh, then you go back to what people in this uh, partial differential equation subject know about that. And the people knew from one century before that uh, the heat propagation is a model uh, using the heat equation. And it is not the density of a fluid, it is the, uh, uh, the um, heat content, which is uh, completely different and it's proportional to temperature. So it's curious that uh, in trying to understand an equation, you find two models uh, in the physical world that are related, but they are not the same, but they go to the same equation. And in fact, they say the, this heat equation was proposed by Fourier around 1807, and it had been studied. So let's go to see what they know. But before you see what they know, let's uh, try to understand better the context. Uh, the idea is that the heat equation is a PDE. And then the, 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 the book about PDEs says that uh, there are linear models and nonlinear models. And essentially, the, 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 book, the first book is writing linear models and studying them, for instance, the heat equation. But nonlinear is very important in the present day physics because many of the equations in the higher order models of physics are nonlinear. For instance, uh, the Newton equations, the relativity equations, lots of the equations are nonlinear. Thanks God, uh, the Schrodinger equation is linear. And then the idea is that uh, if you go to the book in PDEs, you discover that there is a chapter on elliptic equations that seems to be the basic chapter. And now you find it from the heat equation by eliminating time. So you look for stationary states. Now the idea of looking for stationary states is very strong idea. But you begin with an evolution problem and then you discover that maybe the stationary states tell you lots of uh, information about this evolution. Maybe this is where the evolution tries to go. So you study the evolution from uh, models that change with time to the situation where they, they are stationary. And going to these stationary equations, you discover 
uh, beautiful chapters like calculus of variations. Uh, they have an interest in itself. So you get lots of interaction with other parts of mathematics. And then uh, if you want to study the elliptic and parabolic linear equations, you discover that the Laplacian is the main operator. And this is important for us. We will use operators. And uh, the operator in the Laplace equation is, uh, in the heat equation is the Laplacian. And in the elliptic equation is also the Laplacian. And in the Schrodinger equation, it is the Laplacian. So the Laplacian plays a key role in applied mathematics. Now, what we will do in the second part of my talk is trying to go for something that are called the non-local versions of the Laplacian, which are called long range operators in probability, but for the people in analysis, they are called fractional Laplacians. And this is very interesting because they have different properties. They are family, but they are not the same, which is the typical play of applied uh, science. There are many models, they are similar, but they are not the same. And you have to know each of them. This is why you need big groups working on the same subject. And I, re I recall to end this introduction that the number of people you need around to do these projects uh, essentially need uh, people specialized in different aspects. One of them is modeling in order to understand uh, where your solutions are going to be applied. And then you need analysis to solve the equations. And then you need stochastics because some of the equations have noise or Brownian motion. There are terms which are responsible for non-deterministic effects. And then you need asymptotics to know where the solutions try to go to. And finally, you need numerics. And now my subject, my specialty in this business is analysis, what we call analysis of PDEs. So it is a sub domain of analysis called analysis of PDEs. Some people used uh, to call it uh, 30 years ago, applied analysis, but we don't like the name. It's a bit uh, confusing, but you need people around. So if you ask me, do you know people in your group around that do one, two, three, four, or five? I tell yes, I know the people who are responsible for doing numerics when I need numerics. In asymptotics, I do it myself. Stochastic, I know the people. Modeling, I know the people. So it's very interesting to know that you need all of these people. Now, let me go further and try to explain to you a bit of beautiful, <clears throat> uh, pure analysis on PDEs. So analysis of PDEs at the very pure stage. Uh, you take the heat equation in the whole space, as they say in physics, free space, and there are no boundary conditions, which is very important in applied mathematics. If you eliminate the boundary conditions and you work on free space, then you can use the symmetries of the free space because there are no conditions around. And then things tend to be simpler. And there is a beautiful solution that's called the Gaussian. The Gaussian solution is explicit which is beautiful, but it, we don't, you don't need it to be explicit after you know how to do these things. But in the case of the heat equation, it's explicit. And the Gaussian is very well known by people in probability and stochastic and statistics and in, in, in many other things. And uh, it has a decrease in time and a decrease in space. In time, it uh, decreases uh, exponentially in space, it decreases, sorry, potentially, and in space, it, it decreases exponentially, square exponential. And this G is one special solution. So why are you so interested in just one solution? Because this solution has a property of being the reproducing kernel. If you use G and make up an operation called convolution, that has been invented many years ago by people who went around this problem uh, 200 years ago, you discover that once you know G and you know the initial data 
you get by convolution that is very well known by now, all solutions that are uh, able to do convolutions. Essentially, if you look at your book in analysis, in order to do the convolution, the integral has to be well-defined and you discover that this uh, operation works very well in L1, the first space of the Lebesgue, Lebesgue series. It's not L2, it's L1. There is this tradition that L2 is a good space, what we, we used to call when I was young, the French tradition, because uh, it was Jacques-Louis Lyon, the great father of applied mathematics in France, who was really in love with the two spaces L2 and H1. But if you do probability, the good space is L1, not H1. Okay, in any case, if LP spaces for this operation are all, 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 all of them good. And this is really functional analysis. There is no application here. And then after you do this thing, you can do something that in applied people want to know. Suppose you take a certain initial data, you not, and then you let it evolve in time according to the heat equation. What does it look like after a certain amount of time? And everybody knows in this trade, when you are uh, well advanced in your thesis, that the heat equation solutions try to look like uh, a number of times the reproducing kernel, the green function, the Gauss function. It is, so it is very curious. This is called in probability uh, the central limit theorem. And statistics is incredibly important, but it's important also for the people in diffusion, which are doing these heat equations in when t tends to the limit. And what you prove is that u minus a constant times g goes to zero with a very strong rate, even if you multiply the error by t to the n over two, and is the dimension, it still goes to zero. And this is very important. It is called the real rate, the critical rate. When you put d over two, dimension over two, and you multiply times the error, it goes to zero. You cannot do better than that. And this is the central limit theorem. So then all of a sudden you are doing probability. And I told you in the first slide that we are going to do indirectly probability. Now, once, once you do that, you discover that you can do the numerics and try to see what you see. If you do the numerics of the heat equation, which is the approach I'm taking here, the solution tries to look like a Gaussian going down and going down and out. It is the same mass. The Gaussian will be the same as a probability, so it will be a density that spreads out and goes down, but uh, or it will try to go to zero. If you want to see this thing that goes down, you have to multiply the function by something to compensate. This is the origin of the compensation factor t over dimension over two. This t over dimension over two is the rate at which the solution disappears. So you have to compensate to see the errors. But this is what you see in PDEs. Now, if you go to the people in probability, they look and they see the Brownian motion. Now, it's, very, it's completely crazy because the picture on the right and the picture on the left have nothing to do. One of them is really deterministic and see infinity. Another one is really very chaotic and it is not even C one half. In, in, curiously, they are, two pictures of the same phenomenon. This is very interesting to know. And uh, you have in the left the evolution of nice Gaussian and on the right, the random walk origin of Brownian motion doing crazy things all around. If you average 1 million uh, runs of the random walk, you discover probabilities that look like this function. So this is the connection between the two ones, making Monte Carlo in averaging, and then you get this. And this is something that can be done. And you can ask your students how many runs you need to get a small error. So uh, my job will not be solving the heat equation because it's already solved. 
and there are many experts in a, pract a practical parts of it. What uh, people in analysis of PDs do is replacing the heat equation by what we call the parabolic version that has two shapes depending on the order in which you take the derivatives because you know that in applied mathematics you need to do derivatives in the weak sense. So number two version is not the same as number one version because of the regularity of the derivatives that you have to understand the derivatives in the weak sense. And the version number one is called the uh, probability version and the version number two, like the mechanical version of the parabolic uh, equation. Uh, the requirement on the coefficients, you need some small requirements on the Bs and the Cs and the F, but it's very important that AIG looks like the delta like the Laplacian. And the requirement to look like the Laplacian is that matrix has to be positive definite. Once you do this requirement, the rest is relatively easy and you get a course on parabolic equations of the two sides. And this takes a whole semester. And then you get beautiful concepts that you get from this course, like understanding Gaussian function or separation of variables or Fourier analysis or spectral decomposition or Dirichlet forms, maximum principles, Brownian motion, generation of semigroups. There are beautiful things you learn. You never knew before that these uh, concepts uh, can be uh, invented. But once you look at them and you study them, they are part of your life. So I studied that thing around 1970. So it's now 50 years that these small monsters uh, go with me everywhere I go. And they are my friends. And this is interesting because this basic training tool for students changes the life of the students forever. They will get these monsters popping around and making fun all the time. Entropy dissipation is one of my, my last friends. Enter my life around 2000. Okay. And then the idea is that linear is not enough. And you ask uh, experts, where is uh, the source of nonlinear equations? Well, the source of nonlinear equations is nonlinear mechanics. Some of the reactions of mechanics are due uh, due to interactions that are not uh, proportional uh, pile up. And then uh, instead of having a Laplacian of U, you get the following thing. The Laplacian is split into a divergence of a gradient. This is the nabla and this is the D. And uh, di divergence of gradient is Laplacian. And in the middle, you put a power or another function of X and U and DU. And then you get something that is called the nonlinear Laplacian. And this invention was not able to be uh, solved until maybe 1950, but uh, it was not even written as a model until 1850. So it is 150 years that people have been trying to understand the mathematics of the nonlinear Laplacian operator. And it has different uh, models according to what you put here as nonlinearity. And it depends on applied mathematics. You have to go to a book in physics and try to understand the derivation to see what do you have to put. And then you put it and you solve it and you give it a name. I will do it in one minute. And the rest is the lower order term. Everybody in, in this business knows that lower order is okay. So you write this equation and it is called the general nonlinear heat equation. And it was posted around 1960 by Serring and company. After the fundamental work of uh, the George Nash. And then the Georgi Nash opened the possibilities of uh, understanding nonlinear functionals. And then immediately people began to pile up problems that have nonlinear functionals, nonlinear Laplacians. And the idea that you will wonder is 
will they solve this equation in the box? Well, they do something. Uh, first, you split it into one of them, eliminate the B, and then you get no linear diffusion. And another one is don't complicate the, 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 this part, the first part, just put Laplacian, and then the nonlinearity is here, and you call it re reaction diffusion. And unfortunately, uh, solving it is very difficult. So they didn't know what to do. And they was trying to write a theory about this equation beginning in 1960. When I went to the States in 1982, I talked to Serring, who was very, I mean, very kind person. And he told me all this story. And I asked him, but how much progress did you do in 20 years? He said, not much. <laughs> and I asked, so what are people trying to do? He say, oh, Okay, try to understand particular examples, because if you put different uh, nonlinearities, you will get completely different things. This equation has inside enormous richness of structure. So try to understand the separate structures of different examples. And the idea is examples. And the examples are, let's see four of them. The Stefan problem, which is the typical problem of um, phase transition between two fluids, for instance, ice melting in water, a hill show problem, porous medium equation, which has the Laplacian of a power. This is more or less the heat equation, but instead of having Laplacian of U, it has Laplacian of U squared. And this is called porous medium equation. The idea is that nonlinearity destroys all your Fourier analysis, separation of variables. There are no Gaussians, so you are completely destroyed. And you have to start again. In fact, people uh, started again. Uh, the, the study of this equation started in Moscow in 1950. When they went to the States in 1980, 30 years later, there was lots of progress. So we could do a theory. And I had been studying this equation porous medium for, let's say, 25 years nonstop, and then giving it some time later, the last 15 years. And it's very beautiful. I mean, it's part of a life. And then there is evolution pill ablation that is very similar to the porous medium, but not the same. And this is part of the analysis of particular cases. Another possibility is uh, using reaction diffusion. So as I told you, let alone, let alone UT equals Laplace and U and put plus a reaction term. And this is called reaction diffusion. And the person responsible for this equation by putting the, the problem as an open problem that was interesting was Professor Fujita in Tokyo. And we know him. It's a very nice person who came to Madrid in 2007. And there is another version of this equation with instead of a plus, you get a minus, and we call them extinction equations. And these two equations have a problem inside that is really beautiful for mathematicians, which is describing blow up or extinction. And I will not talk about that, that there is a huge community and I spent part of my life working with them just to forget about porous medium. And there was a different community. And then there are systems, but the systems are very difficult. I will not talk about them today. And there's lots of work now on systems because models of realistic physics involve systems, for instance, in biology. And remember, well, for a second, that uh, stationary states of uh, evolution equations are elliptic, and elliptic equations are very important because they also come from calculus of variations. And then I was preparing my talk this morning, uh, and it was a very nice time in Madrid, blue skies over my, my town, Madrid, and there was this tsunami coming to me. And let me tell you what but the tsunami was. It was a terrible thing at the beginning. I say, what happens here? Happens that there was the announcement that the Abel Prize was given. Abel Prize 2023 has been publicized. And then the answer of this uproar about who is the winner is Luis Angel Caffarelli, my master and commander. 
the person that opened to me the roads of beautiful equations like uh, number one, two, three, four. And this is a coincidence, okay? So the idea is that Luis Caffarelli is after several hours today, the new Abel Prize winner. And they, according to this gentleman in Norway, he did seminal contributions to regularity theory for nonlinear partial differential equations, including free boundary problems and the Mon Jamper equation. I will not talk about Mon Jamper equation, but let me tell you which are the free boundary problems. And this was already in my slide before this announcement. Number one, number two, number three, number four. So this is, and the obstacle problem. I will not talk about obstacle, but it is obstacle. And uh, this is big news, this is big news for me and for many people in Spain. For over 40 years, Luis Caffarelli has been a driving force of a very large group of researchers all over the world. It's a truly global endeavor with different capitals because we have been following I mean, nonlinear differential equations are capital where, where Lewis lives. And last one was Austin, Texas. But it, before it was Minnesota, and then Chicago, and then Princeton, and then Courant. So we followed Lewis wherever he went. And this group is driven to solve problems posed by various types of applied nonlinear PDs with free boundaries and the analysis. And I was his friend, collaborator, and I followed him on London overseas, looking for a good problem, a good theorem, a great conversation. And we had it. So it's beautiful life. This is a guy. El Gran Luis Nacido en Buenos Aires. Este Luis, no, 2010. Este conmigo, no, 2015. En Madrid. Okay. Now let me tell you what are non, non local operators. Non-local operators are a version of the previous life where instead of getting a Laplacian, you get an operator that does not have, I mean, now that we know many things about the Laplacians, you go to the list of concepts and you look for some intuitions uh, about the spectral, about the composition, about Fourier, about... Uh, uh, exponential decay, and that exponential decay is very important for the people in probability. You look for random walks, and uh, if the random walk has interaction from one point in the mesh to next point in the mesh, you call it uh, next neighbor interaction. But in the information era, the interaction between the nodes of an, a certain information network is not realistic to assume that you are talking to your neighbor. Because in this moment, I am talking to people in Rio de Janeiro, in Niteroi. I don't know where. And I don't care because the probability of talking to them is made possible by the uh, digital era communication system. So you cannot assume that Brownian motion is true. And in fact, the probability of looking for information in the internet networks is not represented in any sense by Brownian probabilities. Then, then you need something that is called a long distance interaction and the probability in the uh, standard cases is called Levy flights. And this is studied in the books in probability. So this is where the probabilities took the revenge. They discovered, because probability is very strong in looking for new things, that you get these probability densities that do not decay like a square exponential. And then you go to analysis and you try to do the same thing because you want to be friends of probability, but you want to do analysis of PDEs. And you discover that your basic object, which is the Laplacian, has to be replaced by a certain object that is called the new Laplacian. 
And now, let me tell you, by jumping one step ahead, that the new Laplacian is the non-local Laplacian or long-distance Laplacian that we represented like the fractional Laplacian. And the idea that the fractional and long distance are two synonyms, two synonymous, para nos. This idea that the fractional and long distance are the same for us is a very important idea that is the contribution of the combination of probability and functional analysis. It's a very beautiful page of mathematics that has been written recently by the two communities. And we are very happy to report that life is now very beautiful for us. Now, I started doing that in 2007, the analysis of nonlinear PDEs using the operators that represent long distance effects. And this, of course, was due to my uh, mentor, Professor Caforelli, that you already saw one slide before, and he got written a beautiful paper, Luis Silvestre, un estudiante de Buenos Aires que está ahora es profesor en Chicago. And they wrote a paper that is very, very beautiful and well quoted uh, in Communication and Partial Differential in 2007. He has now more than 1,000 quotations in Matsainet. And now let me explain this beautiful thing. Uh, in fact, the fractional ablation operator was known in the community of functional analysis called harmonic analysis. And the idea is that these people know one object, very strong object called uh, Fourier transform. If you do this Fourier transform of the Laplacian applied to you, so suppose that S is one, so no fractions. Suppose that S is one, so the Laplacian is Laplacian. Let me put a minus because it's very important to put a minus to do the spectral analysis. The Laplacian has negative eigenvalues. You have to put a minus to do power. Okay, you put the minus, you put S equals one, and you know that the Fourier transform of the Laplacian is equivalent to multiply by C to the two. And this is called the multiplier of the, of the Laplacian in Fourier transform. So it's okay. Now, once you go to the Fourier transform world, you understand now the word fractional. You take the fraction of the multiplier and then you define the new operator by fractionalizing the multiplier and going back. So you go to Fourier space, you multiply by the, by the, by the multiplier times the power, and then you go back. And if you go back and formally, you will get a convolution because the product uh, of two uh, transforms goes back as a convolution. And when you try to do the convolution, it doesn't work because this power is too singular when it goes back. The function that produces in transform, in Fourier transform, this power, is very complicated. And you cannot do this convolution. In principle, you have to eliminate UX from upstairs. You eliminate UX and you do this convolution. It doesn't work because M plus 2S is not integrable. And this is something that the, the Chicago School knew very well. And it was the, tra the tradition coming from Professor Ries who was a Hungarian working in Sweden for a time in the 1930s. And then the whole theory of this, uh, they call it singular integral operators. This theory was done by Stein in the United States and Lankov in Russia. So there is an operator. This operator is, is well known for people in Fourier. And they, knew, they know how to do things with it. Fourier transfer, whatever. Now, is this related to probability? The answer is, after you analyze it, it's not very difficult once you know that you have to do it because it has to be. It is you take the Levy process and the Levy process is like a transition probability for a Markov process. This is the distribution of timing at side K and this distribution of time M plus one at side J. 
and there are transition probabilities. And now you pass it to the limit. But curiously, it is very important to say that you don't make transitions to next neighbor. That the probability of making mark of transition decays like a power of the distance between the two sides. If you do this limit using the new assumption that you are not doing next neighbor, you don't get the central limit. You don't get the Laplacian. You don't get the heat equation. You get a certain generator. The generator is defined like this. And then this is precisely, this generator is precisely this operator. And this is a miracle, but works. And then Caffarelli came and he was worried because uh, using these two versions was not very good for, for, for nonlinear analysis. And he said, it is better to do something that can be done only with derivatives, not with singular integrals doing with the standard differential equations. And this is what you call the extension operator. The extension operator means that you take a X variable and you augment it by putting Y variable in the X Y variable, which is a larger space. You solve an elliptic equation, which you call the state equation. And then you take the boundary value of the Neumann type. And this is the new operator. And this is a very curious thing that is called uh, uh, augmented space. It's a fictitious space. It's an invention that is very popular in physics, inventing a new dimension. And so the Laplacian in the, in the fractional version is equivalent to a certain Neumann operator. And you started with Dirichlet. So this is called the Dirichlet Neumann. And then once you begin talking to the people in functional analysis, they can kill you because they have new formulas for you. This is the last formula you have to learn, which is called the spectral version. And uh, this, all of this I studied many years and uh, I wrote a book, a version of this, not a, book, a chapter of a book that you can read. And this was written in 2016, the, the year I went on pension. And we organized a Chime course in Cetraro. And there were uh, Springer lecture notes edited by Matteo Bonforte and Gabriele Grillo, our uh, Italian friends. And the authors were Carrillo from Granada, Del Pino from Chile, Figali from Italy, now he is in Switzerland. He is a Fields Medal. Mingione in Italy and myself in Spain. You see, we are an international band. And the uh, second part is, let me tell you for 10 minutes, what I have been doing lately, because it's beautiful and it's different. I want to do nonlinear evolution flows. And since I introduced this um, uh, fractional Laplacians, I want to use them. And the idea is how do you use the fractional Laplacians? Well, you have to make a physical model, try to write an equation for a physical model and try to see if your operator comes inside. Let's do it. The idea is that I begin my model with calculus of variations. As you see in my specialty, I have been trying to play different games talking to different people. Uh, not everybody has to do the work of talking to different communities, but somebody has to do it. Otherwise, the transmission of uh, ideas doesn't work. So and I was relatively, let's say, skillful in talking to different people. So I did this thing. So let's, uh, let's start with calculus variations, something that I like really very much. Uh, in the calculus of variations, you get a certain integral that usually is the simple integral. But if you want to do the famous interaction between one point and another point, replace the derivatives of the typical Dirichlet integral by uh, quotients, different quotients. So the first idea of the calculus of variations in the non-local case is don't use derivatives, use different quotients. 
Uh, now you have to integrate in X and Y because you have two variables. Okay, you do it, it is called W variables. Everybody knows that. Now, instead of two, let's put P to be general. And if you put P equals two, then the equation that you will find as you do the Euler-Lagrange process of minimization is linear. If you put P not two, it's not, not linear. So we are doing the not quadratic functionals of the calculus of variations in the case of uh, doubling variables. This was done by, sorry, by Gallardo in Italy and by Slovodetsky in Russia, in Soviet Union. And they, this thing allows to prove, to, de, to define the semi-norm for the functions a space that will be denoted accordingly, Gallardo or Slobodetsky space. And the semi-norm has to be complemented by the basic Lebesgue norm in order to do a real norm. So this is the norm for this thing. Now, since we know the answer, this will be the fractional norm. And in fact, the, the word fractional has been introduced in functional analysis for the spaces of the Gallardo series. So in fact, people are using Gallardo and Slovodetsky for historical reasons and fractional Sobolev for uh, practical reasons. The idea of fractional Sobolev is already in the book by Leos Majed. So once you have this, you remember that your local uh, exponent is S, which appears here as weight, extra weight. Uh, remember that X, Y, Y, N is normalization for this one. And the P in SP is the equivalent of the integrated, uh, uh, how do you call it? Uh, Holder norm. Okay. P has to be between one and infinity. And then you say mm, the functional can be written like this. It is the same thing, but X minus Y is called Z. And then some people will be uh, merrier, happier with this version. And then you define the double two SP spaces. You go to Leo's Bajen, you already find it. And then you try to do minimization and you get the Euler-Lagrange equation with an operator that we call LSP, which is the fractional P Laplacian. Oh my God, we go from fractional Laplacian now to fractional P Laplacian. You see that this is what has been used in the slide about uh, Fourier analysis as a singular uh, integral by the people in, in Fourier analysis. Now we put a power. Phi is this. Uh, sign power that is typical of nonlinear analysis. So we know now what is the non-local and nonlinear Laplacian. Once you have this, you say, let's solve the evolution. And let's prove, for instance, that you get a certain nonlinear Gaussian and you get convergence to the nonlinear Gaussian. Can you do it? And this is what I started doing in 2016. I wrote the first paper in bounded domains, which is easier. And then I proved the theorem in unbounded domains, which says that uh, there is an object that is equivalent of the Gaussian that has a similar form. Let's eliminate the M because it's the mass. We don't need the mass. The mass is for generality. It depends on the time here, it depends on the time here, and there is a profile, F. So it looks like the Gaussian, if F is an exponential, a square exponential, it will be the Gaussian, but it will not be, in this case, a square exponential. So we have to calculate the profile, the alpha exponent, the beta exponent, and forget about the mass because this is scaling. The alpha and the beta can be calculated, and the problem is calculating the F, improve existence and uniqueness. And that's what I do my theorem. And first of all, let me show that there is a, a, a 
numerical computation that we discovered that is not very difficult to do, that doesn't look like the Gaussian. It looks like a bumpy, like a table Gaussian. And then we did this log log representation to see if the tails are exponentials or powers. And in the log log representation, a power is a straight line. So they are straight lines. So this new object is not a Gaussian, it's a long distance Gaussian, which decays as a power. And we know what is the power because we can calculate it explicitly. And this is another version where you get the parameters changing. And let me tell you that there is a theorem, a synthetic theorem that says, if you take a solution of the problem, of the evolution problem, and you look uh, at the spatial solution that they have constructed with the same mass, the difference goes to zero in the L1 norm, which is the typical norm of probabilities. And if you want to do it in L infinity, you already have the same theorem, but you have to put a certain compensation factor. Otherwise, you, small u and capital U go to zero and you, you see nothing. So you have to put this amplifying factor to see it. And this is what you have to prove. And the proof, I will not do it, it uses a list of one, two, three, four, five, six tools of nonlinear diffusive uh, operators of no local type using a priori bounds, conservation of mass, using derivative estimates that imply compactness, scaling transformations, which is the group invariance, proving strict positivity and proving decay along a Lyapunov of function. And it takes a, takes a long time to prove it. You can do it. And the most important point is, which is not in the list, is that if you don't have a sharp upper barrier, you cannot do it. So Luis Caffarelli was a master of constructing barriers to prove that there are a priori estimates because of the barrier. And this is, I, I was a good student. I was proof that there is a barrier and this is completely new in this, in this object. And then as an homage to people like Luis Caffarelli will prove global hard duck inequalities, which is one of the objects of the more very pure people in this business. And this is the end of my talk for today because the rest of it is lots of details. You can prove on one side, the case is with P is larger than two, and another one, the case less than two. And the case less than two is very complicated. You begin a mess of computations that take you 70 pages of paper. And this is an idea of what is the renormalization group. I will not do it today. And uh, these are the graphs of the case P less than one, less than two, which is the different behavior of the spikes. This is not flat. The new object, the, the soliton that uh, attracts the solutions, doesn't have a table, has a, like a spike. And uh, I will not talk about this, so I will leave you with uh, thanking you for your attention. Gracias, muchas gracias. Thank you very much, uh, Juan Luis. Muchas gracias. Una vez más, un fuerte abrazo por tu charla. Uh, I know that uh, I knew that uh, you were not only an expert but also an enthusiastic uh, student. So, uh, in spite of our age, I see that uh, you continue to be uh, the same. So, thank you very much. Uh, I was I was I was thinking that maybe people since I I am old enough were going to tell me please go away stop it but it is <laughs> no, true no. if you, if you are very stubborn if you are muy muy persistent puedes seguir continuos continuos a hacer un poco de matemática you see that this is not the case for me for my part no? so uh, <laughs> I have a precision I have a precision uh, you have spoken about uh, Caffarelli there's also something that has been done by Caffarelli that is very important, 
there is a contribution to the study of the Navistox equations together Absolutely. with Kohn and uh, Nirenberg. So this is also a, a, a very major point in the in the research of the existence of a regularity problem, uh, the solution to the regularity problem. So, uh, yes. okay. Uh, I agree with you. And I didn't say that because, uh, I mean, there are so many things he did, but it is clear oh, that oh, yes. maybe the main contribution uh, as a separate theory, the best one is this one, 1982. Okay, exactly. Uh, okay, uh, we have time for one question. So if there is some someone who, who wants to make a question, this is uh, the moment. You can uh, make the question by uh, the chat through the chat or uh, activating the the microphone. Okay, okay. I think I have it's, uh, it's my microphone. Right. I have a, a small question. If it is possible to to okay. to with it. Uh, Tell me. Have you have you uh, are you able to uh, uh, explain briefly? Uh, if uh, there are uh, free boundary problems with uh, uh, with uh, this kind of diffusion, with uh, oh fractional... yeah, yeah. If you write the equation for U T equals Laplace and U M, right? This equation I have here. I'm pointing at it. You see that? And instead of the Laplace, and you put the fractional Laplace, okay? Then, uh, a written in this form, you will get no free boundaries. But if you, instead of doing that, you use the splitting and you put uh, a certain fractional here, but not here, which is something that uh, can be done. And this is what we did with Caffarelli, and this is called the mechanical approach to the uh, non local porous medium, then there is a free boundary. Now, there is an interesting idea. If you want to know the regularity of the free boundary of the porous medium, it is proved that uh, for after a certain initial time in the classical porous medium, the regularity is infinity. But in the non-local case, nobody knows. And the problem was posed in 2011, and it's open for the last 12 years. Uh, nobody's attacking it. I mean, it's hysterical. People are now lazy. <laughs> so there is okay. a free boundary problem. The free boundary problem is explained carefully. In, let me see, let me see, let me see. Well, blah, 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 blah. Uh, here. In this note, uh, the Chatraro notes. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. But I will be happy to explain to you. I, probably you can solve it. Okay. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a good end of the, of the talk. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank okay, you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Faut so, pour 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 okay. Mauro? Obrigado, Juan. <laughs>